I'm retired Brigadier General Wilma Vaught, Air Force, and I'm president of the Women in Military Service Memorial Foundation. I went in the Air Force in 1957, which was after Korea and before the Vietnam War. When I went through training, we didn't learn how to fire weapons. Women didn't do that. We went through a course in how to put on lipstick and powder and how to get in and out of a car tastefully. I was one of very few women, military women. I think when, other than the nurses in Spain, uh, there were like six of us. Uh, and, and for a long time, I was the only officer. I always felt it was one of those things that when I did good, I got more credit probably than I deserved. Now, if I had not done well, it would have been bad. And that was very much on my mind that I had to succeed so that other women would have an opportunity to be assigned to the places I had been assigned and do some of the things I had done. The biggest barrier had to do with limits put in the Armed Services Integration Act of 1948 that said that women could not be generals or admirals and limited the number who could be not promoted but appointed as colonels or captains, which meant that in the Air Force there could be only two colonels one the director of women in the Air Force and the second one the chief of the Air Force Nurse Corps. That was there till 1967 when that law was changed during the Vietnam War so that they could recruit more women because of the opposition to the conflict and this could relieve some of the pressure on the draft and there was also a limit to the number of women who could serve at two percent of the, the number of in the armed forces. And when I came in the Air Force in 1957, we were at seven-tenths of a percent. And let me tell you, that's not a critical mass. So if you started thinking about how you want to change things, you had to think, well, gee, they may decide to get rid of all of us rather than to make these changes. Language in that act said that women could not serve in combat, so we were very limited to being assigned to jobs in the medical field or the administrative field. You know, I think the greatest antagonism that, that we encountered was probably when they opened the flight line to women. There was real opposition to that. And the men out there did everything they could to make it difficult for those first women. It was tough. The wing commander asked me to accompany the bomb wing when it deployed to Guam in support of the bombing of North Vietnam. I went over on a KC-135 that was loaded with equipment. In fact, it was one of the last tankers taking equipment. And I spent six months there working for the wing commander as a management analyst. And I was the first woman ever to deploy on a strategic air command deployment. So there were 3,000 and some men in the unit and me. I thought that was about the right mix. I spent a year in, in Saigon. I was assigned to the MACV, the headquarters, and I was worked in uh, management analysis there. But I just had that feeling, hey, you're not going to come back alive. And, uh, and it was kind of an interesting thing because I didn't share that feeling with anybody. And when I came back, uh, one of our a very, very close friend who was an elderly person. And she was telling me, she said, I prayed for you every day while you were there. And I said, well, I thank you. I said, you know, I, I can tell you now, but I didn't think I would come back. And she said, I knew that. And a couple of times, the rockets came within about a block and a half. I remember the first time uh, I was in my quarters, which was a hotel in downtown Saigon about a block and a half from the Central Market, which was a frequent target. And there were rockets went in there. It was about 5.30 in the morning, so I was gonna take the elevator up to the top of the hotel we lived in and see what was happening. I heard a friend knock on the door and she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm getting ready to go up to the top. She said, that's what I knew you'd be doing. I came to keep you from it. And I found out that I was 
would be assigned to the Comptroller Office uh, in management analysis at the Pentagon. I ended up there for four and a half years. And then I spent four and a half years at Andrews Air Force Base, and that was when I was selected for Brigadier General. And I moved from being the, the Director of Budget to becoming the Comptroller of Air Force Systems Command. And then from there, I went to becoming the commander of the United States Military Entrance Processing Command. We were responsible for processing all of the recruits coming in all, to all of the services, giving them their ASVAB test, giving them their physicals, sending them to where they were going for training, and administering the oath of enlistment to them. So I gave countless oaths of enlistment during my period of time. All through my career, even through my last assignment, I would arrive after about two or three months, there would be people coming up to me that would say, well, when I heard you were coming, I wanted to be reassigned because I didn't want to work for a woman. But I just want you to know, I don't feel that way anymore. I would work for you any place. And it was so funny because hereafter, you know, I've been in the service for 20 some years and I got assigned as the commander of the U.S. Military Entrance Processing Command, I got there and one of the first things I learned was that the secretary was either going to retire or, or leave government service because she didn't want to work for a woman. So I talked to her and I said, Tina, you know, give me one week and if you want to leave at the end of a week, you know, I'll help you find another job. Well, at the end of a week, she decided that uh, that she would stay and work for me. And, and she became a close friend. Somebody knew that I had retired and was back in the Washington DC area and asked me to serve on the, the board of directors. And I didn't intend to do anything other than serve on the board of directors. And I missed a meeting and was elected president. And that's when I, that's when I got very interested in this thing. And as, but I went through a period of time of wondering whether this was the right thing to do because we had worked so hard to be integrated, to be accepted as full-fledged military members. And here we're taking a step to set women apart. Was that the right thing to do? But as I traveled around the country and talked particularly to women who'd served in World War II, it became obvious to me that this was something we should do. This is a part of our history as being women. These are things that women have done, that they've accomplished. Here are barriers that we have overcome. These are women who had certain aspirations that they were able to realize, like the women who were in the Women Air Force Service pilots in World War II, who just were so inspired, not only to serve their country, because they were certainly patriots, but they wanted to fly. And this was a great opportunity for them. And for other women, it's other things. It may be working in communications. It may be working in ordnance. And of course, for years, the primary role of women was as nurses. It's just a history that needs to be recorded and told, and it wasn't being recorded. It, the memorabilia wasn't being collected, and now it is. And it'll be here, hopefully, for all time.